2018 was a big year for the AUA. We had two big guidelines that came out. First, the testosterone guidelines. This is the first time that the AUA put out testosterone guidelines. And then we also had the new uh, erectile dysfunction guidelines, which was a third iteration. These are my disclosures, which are also available in your course handouts. So I'd first like to start out with the AUA testosterone guidelines. So just some basics, as, as many of you already know. The guidelines in terms of diagnosis is very consistent with what you already know. You have to have a low serum testosterone level, and we chose the number 300 nanogram per deciliter. You have to have two separate testosterone levels on two separate days, and they should be in the morning. Uh, the patient should have signs and symptoms of hypogonadism. In other words, you should screen anyone who walks into your office for a testosterone value. But there are some exceptions that the AUA put out this year. For example, if a patient has a history of diabetes, has a history of chemotherapy, low bone mineral density, anemia, history of HIV, use opioids, these patients, irrespective if they have symptoms or not, should have a serum testosterone level as a screener. In terms of the testing, uh, we should get an LH to decide is this a primary or secondary hypogonadism. If these patients walk in with a very low serum testosterone level, less than 150, you should be getting a prolactin level and you should also be getting a head MRI. In terms of uh, other labs that we should get prior to treating patients, we should get the estradiol level should not be checked prior to treating men with the hypogonadism. But if a man does come back with an elevated estradiol level, um, you should, uh, they should seek endocrine evaluation. And remember that if patients come in with gynecomastia, breast tenderness, that's an indication to check an estradiol level. Uh, you should get a hematocrit and hemoglobin uh, in patients prior to starting them on therapy. Remember, the number is 54. Above 54, there's a theoretical slight increased risk for uh, cardiovascular injury. So uh, you want to make sure that that number is not above 54. In our practice, if patients have a hematocrit above 52, that's when we start doing phlebotomy, uh, but we don't want them to get to 54. And finally, you should get a PSA. Now remember, some of these guys come in and they're young, they're 35 years old, and I say to myself, should I get a PSA? I'm putting him on testosterone, he's 38. Should I, put, should I get a PSA? And the guideline said, look, uh, under the age of 40, we don't get PSAs, even if you're putting them on testosterone, right? So over the age of 40, that's when you start getting those annual PSAs. So um, other things to keep in mind, at what range should we put the testosterone level in? Uh, clearly, should we put it at 1,000? Should we put it at 500? The AUA guidelines state that the range should be between 450 and 600 is what you're shooting for. Uh, you should discuss the risk of transference to these patients. Realize that the risk of transference with the gel is extremely low. There were 20 reported cases out of almost 2 million uh, prescriptions, but again, um, it is low, but you should warn them about the risk of transference. We generally try to stay away from using gels in patients who have young children at home or a pregnant woman uh, because of the risk of transference. And finally, you should discuss the use of aromatase inhibitors, HCG, and clomiphene citrate in patients who want to maintain their fertility. So as everyone knows, exogenous testosterone is a natural contraceptive. You wouldn't give someone testosterone who is actively trying to conceive. But there are three things you can give patients to help them raise their own natural testosterone. That's aromatase inhibitors, clomiphene citrate, and HCG. So I want to bring up some controversies because the past five years there's been significant controversies with testosterone. And there's been different perspectives, what the FDA has to say and then what the guidelines have to say. And why 2018 was important was because not only did we get the AUA guidelines, but the endocrine guidelines and testosterone came out as well. And I want to show you how the, all three of these bodies can differ in certain topics. Look at the first one, venous thromboembolism or VTE. This is what the FDA put in the package insert in 2014, and you should know this. The FDA says that there have been post-marketing reports of VTE, including DVT, PE, in patients using androgel. And the last line says, if a VTE is suspected, you should discontinue the androgel and initiate appropriate workup and management. That's very important. So if you expect someone's having a DVT or a PE, you stop that androgel. Now, what do the guidelines say? Guidelines for the AUA, first sentence says, patients should be informed that there is no definitive evidence linking testosterone therapy to a higher instance of VTE. Completely opposite of what the FDA is suggesting. And what do the endocrine guidelines say? 
endocrine guidelines say, we're not, we're not really sure, we need more studies to be done, right? So you have one group saying we're not sure, one group saying there's absolutely no association, and you have the FDA saying stop it immediately, right? So how about cardiovascular risk? Well, we conducted a study in 2014, and we looked at, a group of us looked at every study we could find from 1940 to 2014, and we found over 200 articles talking about testosterone and cardiovascular disease. And out of those over 200 articles, we could only find four that suggested that if you gave someone testosterone, there may be a slight increased risk for cardiovascular events. The majority of studies we found suggested that low testosterone is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and that giving testosterone may decrease the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Well, something interesting happened in 2010, and there are several other studies in 2013, 2014. These were the four studies suggesting that there may be an increased risk for cardiovascular event if you took testosterone. Now, I don't have the time to go through each one of these studies, but suffice it to say that I do believe there are significant flaws with these studies, but these were the studies that came out. Because of these studies, you should also be aware that the FDA put this in the package insert. So when you counsel patients, the FDA wants you to know that long-term clinical safety trials have not been conducted to assess the cardiovascular outcomes of testosterone replacement therapy. And to date, epidemiologic studies and randomized controlled trials have been inconclusive determining the risk of major cardiovascular events. Last line, patients should be informed of the possible risk when deciding whether to use or to continue the use of testosterone therapy. So if the FDA wants you to know that if a patient walks in and he's on testosterone or about to start testosterone, you should warn them of the potential risks of cardiovascular events. Now, I want you to know that the EMA, which is the same thing as the FDA in Europe, also looked at all of this data as well and decided not to put any CV warnings in their testosterone packages. After 2014 to, say, 2017, a group of us again then looked at all the studies we could find, again, on tar testosterone and cardiovascular events. And we found 23 studies after the FDA's uh, change in the package insert. And what we found was that, again, none of the studies suggested that testosterone causes a cardiovascular event. And men whose testosterone normalized with testosterone actually had a reduced risk of MI and death compared to those men whose testosterone levels did not normalize. So what do the guidelines say? So the AUA guidelines, very strong. Clinicians should inform testosterone deficient patients that low testosterone is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Very important. The second sentence says that prior to initiating treatment, clinicians should counsel patients that this time we cannot be stated definitively whether testosterone therapy increases or decreases cardiovascular events. But this is a little bit of a dilemma. So a patient walks into my office and he has low testosterone. I say, Mr. Smith, I just want you to know that your low testosterone is a risk for cardiovascular events. But if I give you testosterone, it could also cause a heart attack. It's a little confusing for these patients, right? The last there, the sentence is this, is that if a patient does have a cardiovascular event, the AUA says wait three to six months before we start them back on testosterone therapy. The endocrine guidelines are a little different, and they say, no, you should wait at least six months before we put someone back on testosterone therapy. So what about the indications for use? So you should know that in 1981, all the package inserts had this placed in there. This was a class uh, a labeling. And as you can see, it says androgens are indicated for the replacement and conditions associated with, and they list conditions. Now, let me be clear. On these conditions, where it be pituitary tumor or Klinefelter's, Nowhere on this chart do I see the word erectile dysfunction. Nowhere on this chart do I see low libido. These medications were indicated theoretically for conditions associated with low testosterone. But I do see the word idiopathic, right? So if a patient walks in, he has low testosterone, he has erectile dysfunction, low libido, doesn't have one of these conditions, okay, he is idiopathic, but he's got a hypogonadism. I'm going to treat him. The FDA put out something different in 2014, and it cautions that prescription testosterone products are only approved for men who have low testosterone levels caused by a certain medical condition, right? The benefits and safety of these medications have not been established for low testosterone levels due to aging, even if a man's symptoms seem related to low testosterone. So what happened after this? This is the package insert I showed you earlier, and what was the only change that occurred in the package insert? they took out the word idiopathic, right? So now, 
you have to have a true medical condition. Now, I don't think this list is exhaustive, right? I think there are examples, but again, they have to have a medical condition or it's considered off-label. Now, remember, it's not illegal to treat someone off-label, but we do have to, we do disclose, look, I'm treating you off-label uh, if you are going to treat someone off-label. So what does the AUA and the endocrine guidelines say? They say, this doesn't make any sense. You don't have to have a true medical condition. You just have to have low testosterone and signs and symptoms, and you should be treated. That is consistent with our AUA guidelines, and it's consistent with the endocrine guidelines as well. Nowhere does it say you have to have a true medical condition. What about prostate cancer and BPH? I can't go through this as a whole hour discussion, but I'll give you the highlights. If you read the first line in the FDA package insert, the first line says patients with BPH treated with androgens are an increased risk for worsening signs and symptoms of BPH. You have to monitor these patients carefully. So I just want you to know that there's not a single study in the literature, not one, that shows that. Not one. In fact, if you pull the, the best review article that I've ever found by a delay in, in Kohler, they went through every article they could find on testosterone and BPH, testosterone and LUTs, and what did they find? Either the article showed that there was no effect on urinary symptoms or a significant improvement in urinary symptoms on patients who are treated with testosterone long term. So again, we warn our patients about it, but the data does not support it. In terms of prostate cancer, the AUA finally came out with a statement that I'm so happy because patients come to me all the time and say, Doc, I've Googled it and I heard that testosterone causes prostate cancer. And the AUA finally came out with a statement that said, look, clinicians should inform patients of the absence of evidence linking testosterone therapy to the development of prostate cancer. There's no association, no correlation between the two. But our guidelines went on to say if they have a history of prostate cancer, radical prostatectomy, radiation, we still don't have enough data to say that it's safe, right? That's what the data says. Because we, again, we don't have a single randomized placebo-controlled trial. So I just want to switch gears now onto erectile dysfunction and give you the highlights. I was uh, fortunate enough to be a part of these guidelines. Um, and again, this is our third iteration. So we, we adopted this from the cancer group, uh, really this concept of shared decision making, right? So again, a patient walks in, it's very important to explain to them every single one of the treatment options. You should tell them every treatment option available. And if a patient decides that they don't want to start with something that's least invasive, they can do that. And let me show you an example. This is the old paradigm. Guy walks in with ED, we used to start with first line therapy, give him a PD-5 inhibitor. If that doesn't work, you can go into an injection therapy or suppository. If that doesn't work, you can give him a penile implant. But you would never give a guy who walked in a, a, a penile implant before you'd give him PD-5 inhibitor or a urethral suppository. You know, you would go through this stepwise progression. But the new guidelines, the new AUA guidelines says that's no longer the case. In fact, if you look, if a patient walks in and we use the shared decision-making model, where we go through each one of the treatment options, and we define the risks and benefits of each one of these options, and the patient says, I don't want to start with the PD-5 inhibitor. I want to go straight to a penile implant. That would be acceptable, right, with shared decision-making. Now, again, we monitor these patients. We go through the outcomes with these patients. But again, it's a different paradigm shift than saying start with the PD-5 and follow uh, a, a, a program. So what are the labs? This is important for the residents because it always comes up on the in-service. What are the labs you get for someone with ED? There's three of them, hemoglobin A1C, lipid panel, and you also get a testosterone level as well. And the new ED guidelines do state that we should be getting testosterone on men who have uh, erectile dysfunction, and if they have a low serum testosterone less than 300, they should be considered for therapy. Now, uh, many of you have heard of the concept of penile rehab, and for many years, I'm a big believer in penile rehab, but I will be the first to admit that the data is conflicting. Some of the larger studies, the multicenter Montorsi reInvent studies, have shown that there really wasn't much benefit in giving men daily PD-5 inhibitors versus placebo. I do believe still in my practice on penile rehabilitation, but our guidelines, the AUA guidelines, state that patients should be informed uh, that who desire to preserve erectile function after prostate cancer or radiation, that early use of PD-5 inhibitors post-treatment may not improve spontaneous unassisted erectile function. The second thing is that men with ED and testosterone deficiency who are considering ED treatment with a PD-5 inhibitor should be informed that PD-5 inhibitors may be more effective if you improve their serum testosterone values. 
So uh, in terms of penile implants, it's very important that we counsel these patients appropriately. So for men with ED who decide to have a penile implant, you're obligated to counsel the patient regarding post-operative expectations, and penile length uh, as well. Penile prosthetic surgery should not be informed in the pr performed in the presence of systemic, cutaneous, or urinary tract infections. We all know urinary tract infection, but any cutaneous or systemic infection, you should not be doing the implant. And then again, we also advise against the use of penile venous surgery uh, in these patients. I'm just going to end with a concept here about something you've seen, and you m must have seen this in the news, the gains wave, the shock wave therapy to improve erectile function, stem cells. If you give me PRP, I'll give me $3,000, I'll inject this into the penis, and the penis will recover your erectile function. So the AUA had a couple comments to say about this as well. So there are a lot of shock wave therapies out there, and most uh, clinicians, many clinicians out there are charging anywhere from $500 to $1,000 per treatment, and it's six treatments, right? And so you have to ask yourself, of where's the data to support shockwave therapy to improve erectile function. Now, the basic science is very compelling. If you do shock any tissue uh, organ, what happens is you start in, in recruiting stem cells, you actually get improvement of endothelial function, you get improvement of nerve function. Basically, you're inducing a traumatic state. If I take a hammer and hit your finger multiple times, the finger undergoes a traumatic state. It brings in new blood vessels, growth factors. So that's exactly what you're trying to do to the penile tissue as well. But I will tell you this, that if you look at the randomized control trials, they're conflicting. Randomized control trials are conflicting. There are only four meta-analysis that are out there. We have no high quality level 1A data available and the level 1B evidence is conflicting. And the conclusion is that this should really be limited to large multicenter trials at this point. And the AUA agrees. Shockwave therapy for men with ED, low intensity shockwave therapy should be considered investigational at best. What about stem cell therapy? You've heard a lot about stem cell therapy as well. There's been only four, and actually this is a little bit older, there's only five studies in the literature, only five, looking at giving stem cells to treat erectile dysfunction. Yet, uh, there is a word of caution. There are numerous clinics out there that will give you stem cells, inject them into the penile tissue, and tell you that you're going to have significant recovery of erectile function. Although it may be true, we don't have the studies yet to definitively say that. More studies, randomized placebo control studies are done. You should look. The FDA has cracked down on these clinics, uh, these clinics, these stem cell clinics, and many of the clinics have to moved out of the U.S. and now are in Canada, Costa Rica, but you can't get them in the U.S. You have to go out, outside. So the AUA again says for men with ED, stem cell therapy should be considered investigational. And uh, as just so you know, we at Baylor have conducted the first FDA-approved randomized uh, trial in men getting uh, stem cells to, to treat erectile dysfunction. The only problem I see with this is the, uh, the way we get it. So in our trial, patients had to be put asleep. We had to get 120 cc's of, of fat. Um, then when you take the fat, you put it into these machines called an accelerator, and you inject anywhere from 37 to 50 million uh, stem cells. So if you have to give men multiple stem cells, let's say uh, two or three times a year, this doesn't seem very convenient, right? I mean, so, so there is some drawback about using stem cells in this fashion. If we were able to find an easier way to do it, um, it may be able to compete with shockwave or PRP. PRP is basically taking your blood and spinning it. That's all it is. I spin it a couple times, I take the plasma out, and then I inject it back into the penile tissue. If you look at how many clinical trials are listed on PRP and ED, there's none, not one. But if you look at Google and how many times you see PRP and ED, it's 147,000 results. And the majority are, are claiming bigger erections, improved sex life, better climax, libido, charging you anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 per injection. Now realize these claims came early on, but the first study on PRP and ED didn't come out until 2018, the first study. And in that study, it was only four patients with ED and one patient with ED and PRP, but those are the claims that you're typically seeing. In fact, I just pulled something off the website and it says, look, if you take PRP, oh, by the way, it's called the Priapus shot. So if someone says, what's the Priapus shot? It's just PRP injected into the penile tissue. But firmer, larger, more frequent, longer lasting erections, uh, it lasts up to 18 months or longer, right? Uh, they're saying that if you use this, we can get a significant improvement from five to eight on the ED or the IIEF, but there's no study, right? This is, must have been internal. This is based on one uh, study, but that they didn't even have the IIEF. So 
some concerns about using PRP. So what do the AUA say? This is really should be considered experimental. So I'm the secretary of the SMSNA. We put out a position statement this year. I think it's important. The SMSNA believes that the use of shockwave stem cells or platelet-rich plasma is experimental and should be conducted only under research protocols. And more importantly, uh, the SMSA, SMSNA advocates that patients involved in these clinical trials should not incur more than the basic research costs for their participation. So in conclusion, clinicians prescribing testosterone therapy should be aware of the 2018 AUA and endocrine guidelines and also the FDA changes in terms of diagnosis, treatment, and indication of use. Patients should also be appropriately counseled on VTE, CVE, BPH, and prostate cancer risks. Patients should be informed of all treatment modalities when they are, uh, that are not contraindicated, regardless of invasiveness or irreversibility, as potential first-line treatments and counseled against the risks and benefits of each treatment or treating erectile dysfunction. And finally, the use of shock waves, PRP, and the use of stem cells should be considered experimental at this time. Thank you for your attention.